Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we are going to read a book that Carl has referenced in every show we have done. (laughs) <laughs> Took us, I don't know, 70 shows to get to it. A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. Yes. I sure did like it. A fantastic book. It's the only novel the author ever published in his lifetime. Came out in 1959. Hasn't ever been out of print. I wish my copy had been printed better. I have the Bantam Books edition, and it's printed on sandpaper. <laughs> Mine is a uh, an EOS press book. It's an imprint of Harper Collins. It, it's been around for a while. I couldn't find a digital version of it, uh, but that shouldn't stop you. Dear listener, you ought to go buy a copy of it. It's super Catholic. Warning. Danger. <laughs> it's super trad Catholic because mm. it was written in 1960 before or 59 before the unfortunate incident. Some things happened in the Catholic Church. We might talk about some of that. It's kind of a fairy tale. Oh, hmm. That's a callback to Tolkien. What do you want to say before we get going on it? Well, uh, you should go get it. It's 300 and, uh, 335 pages or so in the edition I've got. I read that there is a, a, like a 1981 NPR, National Public Radio, dramatization of this that's available out there. And I spent about three minutes looking for it on the internet. I sure do want that, actually. Apparently, it's available on CD. Well, we talked about Alistair McIntyre. It's influential to him in his book, After Virtue. I think it might have been very important in in having him think about uh, how we have a moral language that nobody understands anymore. Uh, Walker Percy loved this book. The monks show up at the end of Lost in the Cosmos, if you know that book. Uh, Dr. Carl Shute loves it as well. (laughs) Yeah, I like it. I kind of hate like it, though. It's about the fallibility of human beings and keeping making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. Can I issue a disclaimer first? Sure. Even though it's super Catholic, I think it is relevant for anybody. It's a story about how fragile civilization is and how fragile knowledge is and what people's responsibility to that may or may not be. Yeah, and about the all the Catholic stuff, there's, there's untranslated Latin in here. Lots of it. Lots of it. I think that's also a literary trick. It's like reaching back ages and ages in time. You know, what's the oldest thing that you can find, the oldest continuous institution you can find, and getting some of that antiquity into the story. The novel's about how things stay the same, even though they're changing. And so by having the the Catholic church be a key element in the plot, it's adding to that sense of timelessness. So you can usefully read it, even if you're not of that communion. And you ought to, I mean, at this point, probably millions of people have, this is a, even though I hadn't heard of it until I started hanging around with you, this is a huge science fiction book. Yeah. It makes like the best of the 20th century lists. It's going to be in the top 10 or 20 of almost any reasonable science fiction fans list. And there's some dislocations in there that it does, like where it it makes you think one thing and then it ends up another. So I just want to read that first paragraph. Brother Francis Gerard of Utah might never have discovered the blessed documents had it not been for the pilgrim with girded loins who appeared during that young novice's Lenten fast in the desert. So all sorts of weirdness. Brother Francis Gerard, okay, but of Utah. Of Utah. Of Utah. That's odd. Blessed documents. You know something's up. You know there's a pilgrim. You know it's a Lenten fast. What monks used to do. So you're transported back to the beginnings of monasticism, way back in the deserts of Egypt, where there's a a lady who wrote a book about 1,700 years ago about what monks did around Jerusalem. And they would. They'd all go out in the desert and live in the desert for all of Lent. And then they'd come back for Easter. Mortify the flesh. Sure, sure. Later in the book, one of my favorite lines is, bless me, Father, for I ate a lizard. Yeah. He's going to confession. He wasn't supposed to eat anything, and he caught a lizard and ate it. And so you're put back 
into the past, but then there's this Utah thing. Where is this thing happening? Well, and Carl, we've got girded loins in here too. Yes. I like that too. That's when you wear some sort of a robe, uh, but then you tie the legs up. Kind of, kind of, so you, you have, you're wearing less of a dress at that point and kind of more of pants. If your loins are girded up, you're fixing to do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Brother Francis is out in the desert. You know, he's a novice. He's trying to get accepted in the monastery. It's not so easy to become a monk. It's actually rather hard to become a monk. They keep telling you to go away. And if you keep not going away, then they figure they'll take you. But he sees this, the pilgrim. Do you think it's harder to become a monk than be a monk? Mm, that's a good question. You should ask those folks at Clear Creek. Monastic life, you know, if you're if you're stuck, gosh, if you're stuck on the social media highs and lows and everything, what do you do if you're a monk? So what is life like for a monk? It's some of it's described in here. It's if it's a a strict traditional abbey, and that's the only kind that anyone should think of joining. It's like drinking light beer in it or smoking filtered cigarettes. If you're going to do the thing, do the thing. You're getting up in the morning. You're going to be in chapel uh, six or seven times a day. The services might be brief, but you're going to have the bell's going to ring and you're going to have to go. You have to stop what you're doing and you go and you're going to pray ancient psalms that were written 3,000 years ago, maybe by King David. Then you're going to go back out and do the next job and for an hour or two. And then the bell rings, and then you go back. So your whole life is arranged around something bigger than yourself. And so like PewDiePie says about weightlifting, what does he say? We lift to escape abstractions like time and death. <laughs> right. That chapel bell ringing, that's what it's doing. And a lot of your work, depending on the monastery, might just be farming. It might just be grunt work. You might be a cook. Mm -hmm. You might be a janitor. You might be a cobbler. But it would be very stable. Mm -hmm. And you would be part of a continuous cycle of monks throughout the years. When I visited a monastery in uh, Germany, I, I stayed in one for a month when I was working on my dissertation. And I remember Father Michael Linson, since deceased, was Carmelites. And he was the head of the, this little Carmelite monastery. And he, uh, he would show me around town. And then he brought me down to the crypt underneath the monastery. And he's showing me where all the bodies are. Everybody who's gone before him, and then he points to one spot and he says, that's mine. You know, so uh, it's a life where you're not worried so much about all the highs and lows of the news cycle, mm -hmm. of the economy, you know, of, of even war. You have your job, bell rings, you have something to do. It seems pretty easy. It's hard to commit to it, but it seems pretty nice. Yeah. There's a reason a lot of people went and did it. And that's what Brother Francis wants to do. But Brother Francis has a misfortune because he finds, well, a fallout shelter. And now you know we're in the future. Yeah, he can read the ancient writing because as best I could tell, it's about 600 years from now, the world of uh, Brother Francis. And he can read that ancient, ancient writing. So he's reading there fallout shelter and he's like oh my gosh what was this fallout like he thinks that's a monster mm -hmm. the demon of fallout yes he had never seen a fallout and he hoped he had never see one a consistent description of the monster had not survived but francis had heard the legend right away you know fallout you know what fallout is don't you i do so if we drop a nuclear bomb of which there are still many in the world, we've forgotten about them, but, you know, there's arsenals all over the place. And if you drop one, there is radioactive fallout falling out of the atmosphere around you. You might be hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the explosion and the, the death of the destruction of a city, but then there will be fallout, which will cause you all kinds of problems, like cyclopean children. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're called the Pope's children, the, the, uh, the people who are born deformed. Because in this story, the Pope has said that the church has said, you, if it's born of women, you can't kill it. You count it as human, even though it might not really be. Yeah, they've had to figure that out. It's become a real 
what kind of problem is that? Is that epistemological problem? Metaphysical uh, problem? Uh, gosh, I, I would put it in metaphysics. What huh. well what counts as a human? Yeah. So you have a a, a two eyed creature, one eye per head with 14 yeah. digits on the end of its arms. Like what is that? You know, another reason why I wanted, this is book. One of my favorites is it's where I learned the word bicephalus, By, right? the bicephalus tomato woman at the end of the book. Mm. She's got two heads. Only she was born with one and then it started growing. So there's some, there's some weird fairy stuff in here, you know, uh, we'll get to that. This is interesting here because you said, okay, he sees a fallout shelter. So now we know that we're in the future. That's important to the book because Brother Francis's world is much the same as it would have been for uh, a monk in 1000, 1200 AD. 1500 AD, or even mm -hmm. like our friends at Clear Creek Monastery in Hulbert, Oklahoma, right now. Very, very simple food, simple, important work. They pray their hours. So we, don't, we didn't know what time it was for him. We didn't know what year it was because he's living this traditional way of life that's been unchanged at this point for these people for about 3,000 total years. And uh, we stumble on the fallout shelter. Now we can kind of figure out what the heck is going on. Because time yeah. doesn't exist in the monastery, does it? Right. Or at least not the way it does for us folks with appointments and meetings. And yeah, us folks that think there's such a thing as progress. Uh, right. <laughs> so he finds the fallout shelter. Um, so we know it's the future. We know that there has been a wide-scale use of nuclear weapons and that civilization has fallen. And so this is starting to get you the story of what's going on in the book. Uh, like the, the second chapter begins with a litany, uh, starts in Latin, of course, but so litanies are, are things Catholics do or things Catholics used to do. Go to church and you pray for a whole bunch of things. Church listicles. Yeah. That, well, exactly. So from a spirit of fornication, Lord deliver us from the lightning and the tempest, Lord deliver us and the scourge of the earthquake from plague, famine and war, all that stuff anyone would have done. From the place of ground zero, from the reign of the cobalt, from the reign of the strontium, from the fall of the cesium, from the curse of the fallout, from the begetting of monsters, from the curse of the misborn. And then it goes back to traditional litany from perpetual death, you know, uh, deliver us and help us. But you have these things. But here's what I think some someone like McIntyre found very suggestive. They're praying this litany. They don't know what fallout is. They don't know what cobalt is. They don't know what strontium is. These are mystical words of power that have come down to them. Mystical because words of power. <laughs> they've forgotten everything. Yeah, they've lost most science and technology in this this reign of cobalt, this reign of strontium, this fallout is almost part of their institutional memory and it's been mythologized. It's like so it makes me think of, you know, stories about dragons or witches or something like that that you might have gotten from the great flood or the great flood right was there a flood i don't know maybe we have a story about it right what was grendel don't know i don't know but probably something bad that was not well understood or later became not well understood and so you have this puzzle of <laughs> so what is the what is the litany going to be in a 600 years about covid <laughs> From the Shanghai Shivers, deliver us. Oh, I don't know. Probably from, I don't know. I, from the anonymity of the mask, deliver us. Yeah, but just imagine all the stuff that, it's a good thought experiment. Imagine all the stuff that we do today and then fast forward 500 years and they've become solidified traditions that nobody knows. Like the co-host is wearing a hat right now. Okay. If he were to see a, a, a lady walk by, he'd probably tip his hat. Why do you tip your hat? Because that's what we do, and that's what we've always done. No, because you used to have a visor. It, it comes from, like, chivalry. Right. Middle Ages. Handshakes the same way. You show that your weapon hand is empty. Right. So there are things that become covered over, and we don't remember what their origin was. So that's a spooky thing right there, is just thinking about, well, gosh, they don't even know all this stuff. Uh and what have we forgotten? And so when McIntyre is writing in his book about uh, using words of morality and thinking we know what they mean and we don't, it's directly inspired by this book. So what happens is after the deluge, after the flame deluge, 
there was the simplification where they were mad at the scientists. This is part of the themes of the book, the scientists who figure out how to blow up the world and they killed them all and they burned all the books and they destroyed all their history because they were mad at it and then they forgot it. Yep. But there was this saint, this person, Isaac Edward Leibowitz. Well, at this point, he's not a saint. He's not a saint yet. So it's hard to become a saint. Yeah. How do we pronounce this word? Beatus? Beatus. Beatus. So there's stages. This is some of the, the Catholic stuff. He's Miller is, is borrowing antiquity from Catholic things. So if you are a good person, you might be venerable. Somebody's going to call in. If, if Miris is listening, he'll correct me on anything I get wrong. If you are a good person, you could be declared venerable which means that perhaps your religious order might pray. They might venerate you. Yeah. If you're a beatus, that means you're a blessed, which means that um, maybe more people can. Your, your cause has been opened. And the way you become a saint is there are miracles attested to your intercession. The thought is that God wants it to be known that you are enjoying the heavenly banquet and therefore will do great works like heal people of cancer or something through the, the intercession uh, to you. And then the church makes a declaration that this is an, in fact, a saint. They don't make saints. They, they think they're just recognizing a fact. Is this like leveling up in Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crosses. Yeah. Yeah. And they're pretty strict. At least the current church has been pretty strict on what counts as a miracle. They don't mess around with this. So they've got, their founder is Isaac Edward Leibovitz, who was an engineer before the flame deluge. And after the deluge, he survived. And eventually he became a Catholic and a priest and founded a monastery that preserves knowledge. Yeah, it's a, it's a new order, right? Yeah. You talked about going and staying with the Carmelites and there are these Benedictines and there's these Franciscans and... Jesuits, we've heard of all so many of these. Well, this is a new order, and you know, I don't know if they follow the Benedictine thing, although they seem to, but they have layered on top of all of that an obligation to preserve the blessed documents and uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they're the librarians and archivists for the cosmos at this point, and they call themselves bookleggers. Yep, they'd have to find these books and hide them and spirit them away and transport them out to the deserts where the, where the Abbey was. And then there were, so there were bookleggers and memorizers. So it wasn't good enough to just get the papers or the books and hide those. They had to memorize them too, just in case those oversimplifiers came yep. and destroyed everything. Yep. There's a modern movie that's probably inspired by this with Denzel Washington in it. I forget what it's called, the book of some, something or other. Uh, and it turns out that the main character has this book that everyone wants. And the book is, well, he's memorized the Bible because hmm. there's no more books anymore. And so one of the things that the monks would do, if they couldn't, they would just memorize stuff and preserve it and write it down and do the best that you could. It's not so hard to imagine a time when the past is wiped out and destroyed. When all the angry people, angry mobs just ripping books apart. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Stuff like that might happen. <laughs> I love that in this book that Latin survives more than English does. Not just because I like Latin, but we've talked about the Lindy effect on this show. You know, the idea that the older something is, the more likely that it will be older mm -hmm. at some point. You know, Latin's older than than the English is. That tells us that it has a greater chance. If you believe in the Lindy effect, then it tells us it has a better chance of outliving English. And here uh, in chapter two, Francis is having trouble with his pre-deluge English. As he sa it says here, it took him a while to figure out that in English, slave boy was the same thing as boy slave, but house cat did not mean cat house. Because you know, English isn't like Latin. You know, people say, oh, why would I learn Latin? It's a dead language. In being dead, 
I don't think it's actually dead, but in being dead, it's completely prescribed. You know, we know everything about it. It's mostly dead. Yeah. But its condition is stable. Right. It lives <laughs> in Carl's mind like elves. It's likely to stay in its current state for a, a long time. You know, even if the church should abandon it, there'll be some rad trad sect somewhere that insists on everything being in Latin. And then 500 years later, it'll come back. He says, what of a triple positive like fallout survival shelter? You know, the cat house, house cat thing. Yeah. Where's the noun in that fallout survival yeah, shelter? What is that? <laughs> so they f he finds some things. He finds a uh, inner hatch sealed environment. So it's a fallout shelter. Um, it didn't protect the people in it. He finds a skull with a gold tooth in it. Mm. He finds a note, some some kind of heartbreaking notes from Leibowitz, apparently. He had a note to Carl in my book on page 26. Carl must grab plane for undecipherable in 20 minutes. For God's sakes, keep M there till we know if we're at war. Please try to get her on the alternate list for the shelter. Can't get her seat on my plane. Don't tell her why I sent her over with this box of junk, but try to keep her there till we know... Uh, at worst, one of the alternates not show. So he's given his wife this box of junk and called it top secret and said, take this to the shelter to get her to go because she wouldn't go. And of course, she doesn't make it. That turns out to have been her skull. With a gold tooth. Yeah, but it, it's got a, a circuit design, a shopping list, a racing form, a list that says pound pastrami, can kraut, six bagels. What's a bagel? Right. Reminder, pick up form 1040. <laughs> I love that. So they don't know what any of this is. But Francis is a member, or he's a novitiate. He's trying to get into this order here that already follows the work of Leibowitz. And he just stumbles on to some original documents from Leibowitz. 600 years out. It's a miracle. Mm-hmm. Well, and the, the pilgrim had told him where it was. The pilgrim. So the pilgrim came by, and I guess he helped the pilgrim. I forget what he did for him. He does something kind for the, the pilgrim, and the pilgrim finds him a stone for his shelter, and then it turns out the stone is from where the fallout shelter is. So the pilgrim's an interesting character, too. I, I almost don't want to unpack all of the, the little magical details in there, but this is the worst thing that could possibly happen to Brother Francis. Because he wants to be a monk. He just needs a, a low profile is what he needs. Yeah, he wanted. He just wanted to be a low profile, like sweeping the floors. And now he's a celebrity. The reaction from the abbot and the, the father that comes out to give a confession, it's, it's, they're like, shut up, don't say anything. It's really funny. Yeah, <laughs> they, they give him a dozen opportunities to lie about what he's seen. They give him a dozen opportunities to deny that he had seen what he had seen. Because they just, like, please don't rock the boat. Because the abbot knows that if any of this is true at all, he's got to contact New Rome. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want that. It's a big hassle. You know, there's a... He's a bureaucrat, man. You have to imagine, you know, dear listener, what would happen if there was a miracle in your neighborhood? <laughs> like a genuine bona, bona fide miracle. What's that? I don't know. Like, uh, there's a church near me that allegedly has... Um, what's the right term for it? There's an icon that they have that is exuding oil. Mm. Okay. Well, it was it's an Orthodox church. It's a big hassle for them. They got to talk to the bishop. What if the news people find out about it? You know, I can imagine the, the old Greek priest going up to the icon and saying, couldn't you just stop? <laughs> <laughs> you know, presuming it's genuine, but pr for the sake of the story, presume it's genuine. And now what do you do with it? Reevaluate everything. Plus, you become celebrities. It's just, it's a big hassle. So they're trying to get Francis to say he didn't say anything, but he won't. He's honest. They have to deal with it. I love Abbot Arcos. Like this big bear. He's so angry about it. Like on page 47. Let's see. So I'll have to read a little bit of it. You do not dispute that you have won overnight fame, that Providence selected you to discover this this junk box, as its previous owner no doubt rightly called it, the novice stammered helplessly and somehow managed to wind up wearing a grin. You are seventeen and plainly an idiot, are you not? That is undoubtedly true, my lord abbot. What excuse do you propose for believing yourself called to religion? No excuse, Magister Maus. 
<laughs> on the next page. What is your opinion of your own execrable vanity? My execrable vanity is unpardonable, my lord and teacher. He's trying to, he's being harsh on this young man because, you know, speaking of, you know, I knew a guy, I knew a guy who claimed to be receiving visitations from the Virgin Mary. Hmm. And pretty sure he was not telling the truth. Because hmm. I know other aspects of his character. I know this person. I won't tell you all the details. It's the sort of thing he would do. Because if people believed it, now what happens? Now he's special. He's special. Right? A friend of mine says that he was in chapel next to him and he smelled roses one day. I wouldn't put it past the kid to have like, brought some rose water in. It made the smell happen. You know, it's a real attraction for a certain kind of liar to do this kind of thing. Okay. And so the abbot is testing him and, and berating him. It's uh, The author must have had some experience with this. We know a little bit about his life story. He, he's one of the people that bombed Monte Cassino. He was a tail gunner in the military, and apparently it bugged him a bit. Well, the first part's mostly about Brother Gerard and trying to get... Brother Francis, and trying to get the founder beatified. But there's some interesting bits, because one of the things that Francis finds is a blueprint. If you don't know anything about blueprints, a blueprint is a way to transmit, transfer a drawing from one sheet of paper from one. And, and when I was a kid, they would draw it on like mylar sheets. So you would draw the original plan on sheets of mylar, and then you would run it through a blueprint machine and the light would hit the paper and you'd expose it to ammonia and you would transfer the image from one to another. It's like a, a Xerox machine. Yeah, it's pre, pre-Xerox duplication technology. And in ours, it actually, uh, we didn't have reverse printing, but depending on your blueprint machine, what'll happen is the part that's exposed to the light will turn blue and the part that's not exposed to the light where you have your lines will be white. And so a blueprint's kind of a reverse image. But they don't know that. And so when they make their copies of blueprints, because they have to preserve memorabilia because paper fades, goes away. So they're spreading ink out on the whole page and leaving blank white lines. And it takes them forever to copy because they don't understand that it doesn't matter that it's dark and light. It's easy to read this and say, well, they don't understand how dumb are they. Right. It's easy to say that. It's easy to say, well, why couldn't they just stare at it long enough to figure out that it must be a result of their, you know, printing or duplication technology or whatever? And why didn't they figure it out? Here's what they did figure out. They figured out that all this stuff mattered more than almost anything. Mm -hmm. And everything else, everything else is just details. Yeah. Yeah. They know it's important enough, these technological achievements and this understanding and these feats of rationality really are important enough to uh, cover a, a size D drawing with ink if you have to, to reproduce it. They also, a thing that's kind of haunting for me is that they don't have any illusions that they're going to figure it out. Yep. They're just book leggers. They're just archivists. They have a pure, clean mission, which is just to protect these things. They're transmitting a gift. Yeah, they're transmitting a gift to future generations where somebody will figure it out. They don't even know what the gift is, and they're doing it. They really right. don't even know what it is. Well, you can get, one can get sad if you're on, especially if you're on the social media roller coaster, uh, and think that nothing that you do matters. That's a temptation. I would say, because you don't see ready progress. But if you think of it in terms of, you know, like a monk in the Leibowitzian order might think of it, what are you doing? So why are you trying to get this OGB thing to grow and to uh, to thrive? Because we're book leggers. Yeah. If it bears great fruit, when's it going to bear this fruit? I don't know. If we were going to try to like be corporate and get metrics, in what 10 ways is your life made better by having read Aristotle? You might despair. I don't know. 
I don't know, but you know, you're casting these seeds out, and and so books that nobody wants to read anymore are being read by at least six hundred of us. You don't know what's going to grow from that, and if you have, you can detach yourself from caring about immediate success. I think that's a good thing. And so none of these monks are caring about immediate success. They're just doing what they're doing because they think it's a good thing to do. Because time is exposed as an abstraction when you're in the monastery. Yeah, you can forget uh, forget what day it is. Well, Friday's a fast. It brings you back. <laughs> it brings you back. Well, Brother Francis, finally, he makes it. He makes the cut. And then he gets a job in the... Um, I don't know. We're going to call it the print shop. What did they call it? The scriptorium. The scriptorium. The scriptorium. In the old days, all of the books were copied by hand up until Gutenberg. So any books before, when was Gutenberg? 1500s, 15th century? Yeah. Any books before then were copied by hand by somebody paid to write out a book letter by letter. Because civilization has fallen, they need to do this. So he works in the scriptorium. What does he do there? Well, in the beginning. <laughs> well, in the beginning, he's just a, he's just a regular old copyist, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Uh, but he starts learning how to illuminate and do il- illustrations. But he starts out just you know, watching people work, and then he actually gets to have a, a quill and ink and um, is just a copyist. And he writes, uh, he writes out everything that he finds, leaving the first letter go- off of what he writes, so that of uh, the of the paragraph at the top of the page, so that the illuminator can come in there and make that big, beautiful, gilded, curly Q laden M or whatever it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And then later on, he learns how to illuminate. This is still Father or uh, Abbot Arcos, right? I think. Right. Arcos lets them all. I think, as best I could tell, he lets everybody at the monastery uh, have a pet project that they can work on in their spare time, which is, you know, an hour a week or something like that, because they have almost no spare time. And um, Brother Francis decides that he is going to copy that blueprint and and illuminate it. I think it's pretty good. Mm Mm-hmm gold leaf and filigrees and little animals. And uh, if you've never seen one of those, you should, you know, go to DuckDuckGo or something and, and search one up and look at it uh, and see what these people had done. This is anonymous people making masterpieces through the ages where we didn't quite have so much civilization. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the, the illuminated copy he's going to make, there's a conversation that he has with another one of the monks, Brother Jairus, who is like making fun of him because they have no idea what it is. Francis says, the subject matter of electronics was the electron. So it is written indeed. I am impressed. I know so little of these things. What, pray, was the electron? Well, there is one fragmentary source which alludes to it as a negative twist of nothingness. What? How did they negate a nothingness? Wouldn't that make it a somethingness? Perhaps the negation applies to twist. Oh, then we would have an untwisted nothing, eh? Have you discovered how to untwist a nothingness? Not yet, Francis admitted. Uh, (laughs) So they have no idea. These are the typical words used in atomic physics and and quantum physics. And you think you know what they mean. You probably don't. They have no idea what they mean. You mean the physicists now? Yeah. No, I mean... (laughs) Well, I don't think the physicists now know what it means either. Well, we know we turn the light switch on and it does stuff. That's true. We don't know how. I don't care what they say. <laughs> this whole little debate between uh, Jairus and, and Brother Francis is a uh, Socrato Aristotelian. Mm-hmm. It's great. It is, and it, well, the thing that Jairus is pointing out some things. You, you're going to talk about a, a nothingness so that doesn't make any sense. And how do you negate that? It's crazy. So defend yourself, Francis. Well, Francis doesn't know enough theory. Perhaps Leibowitz could have defended himself. Uh, you could do the same thing with calculus, for example, which talks about infinitesimals. Well, how can you have an infinitesimal? What is this thing? And you go through the conversation and maybe you reject calculus, maybe you don't, but at least you'll understand what you're talking about rather than accepting magic. 
I love that little conversation. All right, so he's got this illuminated copy, and he gets sent off to New Rome. Not quite sure where New Rome is. Yeah, they never really say that. This drawing, by the way, is of Stator Winding Model 73A, three-phase, 1800 RPM, five-horsepower, Class A squirrel cage. They have no idea that this is an electric <laughs> motor that drives a squirrel cage fan in somebody's HVAC system, you know, 600 years prior. Yeah. But, but he's writing this all out by hand. And it's a schematic because it's an, electro, uh, it's an electrical circuit. And uh, St. Leibowitz, the engineer, signs off on it as a practical engineer. And he, so they have his signature on there. I mean, this is some serious stuff. It'd be like if we found a brand new document signed by Augustine or something. Mm-hmm. But it's a schematic, so it has little symbols on it. Yeah, and they don't know what the symbols are. This made me think about all this. Cause, so Jairus and Brother Francis don't know what the heck it is they've got in their hands. It's certainly information, right? I think you and I would say that it's information. Yeah. The schematics, you know, here's a capacitor, and here's another little squiggly thing for a resistor. It's got information on it. But they don't know what it is now. So it, it's somehow it became not knowledge, right? Right. It was specific knowledge that uh, Leibowitz and people like him had had and could use and apply to technological, I don't know, applications. And it was real knowledge. Well, now the information isn't knowledge anymore. It's just information with no context. Brother Francis and Brother Jairus don't have anything to stand hmm. on when they look. They don't have the fund of knowledge and the scaffold that you need to decode this and make this useful knowledge. That whole thing is very interesting to me. You know, when does information become knowledge? What happens there? Well, flip the question. When does information become not knowledge? Yeah. And how could it happen? I, I was just thinking, there was a, a discussion over one of the Barbell Logic coaches was wanting to buy a new computer. And so there's a little thread. She's not a tech person. She has no idea what's going on. She she bought an, an Apple because she's always bought them. But you ask question, what does processor speed mean? What is what does this mean? In the seventies and the good old days and in the eighties, we would build our own computers, you know, not from scratch, you buy the parts, but you'd know what you were doing mm -hmm. and you'd know what things meant. And now we get shiny boxes that have mystical components inside them that do what we want them to do. So Carl says, You whippersnappers. I did. I think I did say that. Buy your computers. So you can see even in that, if, if you were any kind of a computer hobbyist in the 80s, all of that's become not knowledge. Most people have no idea anymore. Yeah. My, my children have iPads and devices and Dell laptops. They really don't understand directories, folders, like what, you know, how, how is the information stored on the drive? How is it retrieved from the drive? You know, if you use an iPad or, an, or uh, any smartphone, even a Google phone, I, I don't think you have any idea, but most people would have no idea, you know, where the information goes, how there's a nested hierarchy of files, what the file is, it's, it's being lost. So that's just an example of the not knowledge. There's other examples. McIntyre's whole book was about how ethics has become not knowledge. Yeah. Right. All sorts of things that can get forgotten and you won't understand it. And Brother Jairus, when he's kind of picking on Francis, he really is trying to figure out what the heck it is that's in front of them. He says, what's its, ge talking about circuit design, what's its genus, species, property, and difference, or is it only an accident? They don't have the first idea about what that thing is. I used to have this waking nightmare about this kind of stuff, Carl. Do you know anybody that knows how to draw a thousand yards of copper wire? No. You know, there are people that do it, and it would be very easy to lose that. Then what do you do? You know, lose that knowledge, lose that skill, lose the mm -hmm. capability to draw wa uh, copper wire. Or lose access to the people who know how to do it. Yeah. Or fill in the blank. Canning technology. You know, it used to be everybody's grandma would can tomatoes or whatever. And now uh, Libby and Green Giant and whoever cans it for you and you get it at the store. So this information is getting stored 
in successively fewer and fewer places, even though we have the internet and they're like, oh, we've got the whole knowledge of the entire world right here on your smartphone. Mm, uh, maybe mm. not. Specialization, even though that information may be on the internet, it's bits and bytes. It's not concrete. It can be EMP'd. Yeah. And vital, vital pieces of knowledge are being relegated to smaller and smaller groups of people. Worries me a lot. I picked up a, a book. What was it on? It's on tinsmithing. Hmm. I did, not an actual book, just a downloaded book, of course. I can imagine somebody having a copy of this book and going out to a shop and repairing his pots and pans. Yep. And I was reading reading through it and, and thinking, I don't even know the first thing about how to do this. There are so many lower steps that everybody used to know like about the blueprint that a blueprint it doesn't matter that it's it's uh white on dark to even approach tin smithing i'd need like 10 years of apprenticeship right and so even if you do you can go on the internet and find a book on how to do this well, but you you don't have any of the habits or, or conceptual framework to figure it out it's about fragility mm, i think so it doesn't take much for things to break. Yeah, it's about fragility and what it might be like if it does break. It lays a lot of things bare for me that we can take for granted. Like the schematic that he's drawing and that he's duplicating. The schematic itself, I don't care what's on it, but the fact that those things exist and those symbols and all that stuff exist... That itself is an enormous technological innovation and tool that we have at our at our fingertips, and we just take it for granted. You know, it took a long time and a lot of man hours and a lot of a lot of thought to standardize how these circuits are represented on paper so that they can be reproduced without error in the millions or billions. You look at a drawing, you think, okay, well, that's just a drawing of the circuit. The circuit's the important thing. Maybe not. No, maybe the drawing's important. I'm thinking of um, the very first job that I did when I was a, a young man. So my dad, who is an OGB member, was a land surveyor in Illinois. He was the 2,106th land surveyor licensed in Illinois. I think my, my grandfather had like a, he's like number 10 or something. Uh, he had a real low number. But so the first job was out with a guy named Billy Joe, Billy Joe Crownover. There's just so much of, of history that, so he was from, I remember he was from Alabama. He'd had polio as a kid. Uh, he's a friend of my dad. He'd worked for him for years and years. So he kind of walked a little bit sideways. And our first job was out in a soybean field, I think in Moni, Illinois. Hottest I've ever been in my life. And we were supposed to do a topography so I got into this just at the end of the old technology. So you had an old theodolite transit thing, and we would we would run a grid on the whole property. And if you've never been in a soybean field in the middle of summer, it's real hot. But uh, we had to go like every 50 feet, maybe every 20 feet, and, and take a reading the old-fashioned way by putting a level on a spot and citing the level and collecting a whole bunch of numbers in a book that you would then take back to the to the draftsman who would transfer it and make it into lines of iso lines of a particular elevation using like french curves and pencils to do it to get a topography and that's what you got while i was working we went completely computerized where it would be a laser sight you didn't have to do any thinking, just went boom, 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 took a bunch of data points, went back, pressed a button on the computer, and it would do it all for you. And that's progress, and that's better, I suppose. It's certainly labor-saving, but it means you could look at a topography and not have any idea how to do one. Yeah, so you could be a surveyor, probably, and not have a working knowledge of how to do all of that stuff. You just get your Nikon total station set it up, and then you hook the USB cable to it, up to it when you get done and download the numbers in a big table and then import that into AutoCAD and it'll spit out a drawing for you. I just got done doing some surveying myself, you know, with a, with a real live surveyor. And uh, he said, no, we're going to get out the, 
theodolite and you're going to do this the real way because <laughs> if we get out the total station you won't know you won't know how this works it's a freaking nightmare guys you can't build a pyramid a roman road a skyscraper or really even a, to, a, a potato patch without it there are people out there that know how to do that yeah and it's not to say that you shouldn't use the modern fancy labor saving stuff sure but it's a real quick way to make knowledge into not knowledge if you train someone on how to use the Nikon total station, they know what the menus are and they know where to put in these certain numbers. They know how to zero it and then go. What they end up knowing how to do is operate that machine. They don't mm -hmm. know how to survey. Yeah. What well, I give you another example of things becoming not knowledge. I've been in a fast food restaurant when the computer goes out and the people behind the counter don't know how to make change. Yeah. They can still make the burger and sell it to me, which is some places couldn't even do that. But it said to give me, you know, $4 and 38 cents a change and the look of panic on the face of this person who could not count out change because she'd never had to. Yeah. It would just spit out the coins for her. And so just basic, basic counting of American currency became not knowledge for that person. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All this stuff drives me so crazy. <sighs> There's a, a, a an interesting story. So Francis gets to go to New Rome. There's some stuff about New Rome. New Rome looks very splendid, but then he looks a little closer and it's all threadbare and just hanging on. When he first shows up and he's awed by the gravity of how they conduct themselves and the ceremony, it's all splendid. But when But when mass is over, and people start leaving the wherever it is they're congregating. I can't mm -hmm. remember what room it is. Then he sees it as it is. When the ceremony leaves and it's just the furniture and fixture, then then it's plain, and then it's shop worn, and then he can see it. I like that. Yeah, we have an expression amongst Catholics called "smells and bells." Probably Episcopalians have it too. "Smells and bells" is is uh, like high mass. Um, usually for the big feast days, you do all the ancient stuff. So you get out the incense and everything and it's all very impressive and solemn, but the reality might not be nearly so grand. I mean, it is grand, you know, you're doing a 2000 year old ceremony as well as you can. So there's gr grandness to it, but it might be a country priest in a falling down parish yep. reenacting. So every, gosh, we didn't get to do Easter Sunday this year, but. So Easter Sunday is the big feast. And so in the great centers in, in Rome, um, in the old days in Jerusalem, I bet it still is in Jerusalem, in Hagia Sophia, you'd have these enormous, elaborate, week-long celebrations of Easter. But see, every parish priest in every little country church anywhere is participating in that big celebration, even though it's it's a little, and he, if it's like an Eastern priest in Orthodox, he's probably got like eight kids running around and, and barely making ends meet and uh, still partaking of the eternal. It's cool. There's a lot of that stuff in this book that Miller is borrowing about. I, I was reading a biography of him. Apparently for about 10 years, he was pretty, pretty Catholic. I don't think he stayed that way. Probably because he was part of bombing Benedict's monastery. Mm -hmm. Monte Cassino, you know, the one that the St. Benedict, the famous one, went to. So anyway, Brother Francis... He gets robbed on the way to, to Rome, and they steal the illuminated copy, but not the real copy. Yeah. Francis spends 15 years illuminating this copy because it's his pet project. He can only do it in his spare time, and it's slow work. And he thankfully tricks the robbers into taking the illuminated copy with the gold on it and all the paint, and it's beautiful, and leaving the 600-year-old crumbly, cruddy, really a uh, blueprint that's what he that's what he really values and he's relieved that he was able to do that but he's he's sad about it what a waste the pope at the time so, so then the bandit thought your work was a treasure itself it was nothing holy father i only regret that i wasted 15 years wasted how wasted if the robber had not been misled by the beauty of your commemoration he might have taken this might he not so leo the 21st takes the blueprint for me, that's another thing, you know, when you, you're doing work that you think is good and you're not sure that 
it's ever going to bear any fruit. But if it hadn't been for that, the great thing wouldn't have happened. Would high quality work ever not be ultimately good? Well, there's a reward in the work itself. Yeah, if somebody uh, illuminated a Charlie's chicken menu. <laughs> or the shopping list, pound pastrami for M. Could that ever have been a waste, you know? No, I don't think so. If it's a good thing to do, it's a good thing to do. And if you're you're too tied up in... Utility? The extrinsic good that you're going to get out of it. Yeah, utility is a good word for it. Then you start to forget about the good of the work that you did. And he did good work here, and he was sad. And good old Leo, Pope Leo, Leo the 933rd or whatever he was, <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. If you hadn't illuminated that, the robber would not have been... Uh, tempted by that shiny thing and we would have lost the original great perspective and poor mm -hmm. francis he couldn't see it in his sadness for what had they taken place it's it's, a, it's great should we go to the second section there's three sections in this novel apparently there were originally three short stories published yeah it's interesting it's three halves i don't know how he did it but he managed to get three halves out of this uh, this is a good time for me to make a plug, Carl. These people should go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and sh sign up for our VIP list, which is our mailing list. You'll get our newsletter and you'll get white papers and all kinds of interesting things from us about the great books and how to read the great books. Some advice on maybe how to start a group of your own in your own home. That's all we ask. No, that's not the only thing we ask. We also ask that maybe you go to iTunes and leave a review, a good review. That could be helpful to us. Or... Uh, recommend the show on Stitcher or Overcast or whatever it is you use to catch your pods and listen to them. Carl, I want to read your review. Here it says okay. five, five stars. Who I'd want to be if I were smart. And I'm like, oh man, this guy's going to blow some smoke up my ass. I can't wait. And it says, Dr. Carl Shute is that guy. Scary, smart, well-read, oh. and he knows that elves are real. Mr. Hambrick's acerbic wisdom provides a comedic and rhetorically admirable counterpoint to Dr. Schutz's poetic idealism. Thank you, gentlemen, for the many hours of vicarious intellectual engagement. How about that? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's also kind of weird. It's super weird. Here's one. Longtime listener, first time caller. It says, the OGB podcast has consistently stirred my affections, put a stick in my craw, and set fire to my imagination. Mostly has compelled me to seek what is good, true, and beautiful with more vigor than at any other time in my life. As Carl said recently, if you're reading along with us, thinking along with us, if you're developing your inner life, your days are going to be longer. You're going to have more experience, a richer experience. I find that to be my experience, and I'm richer for it. Don't just listen to the podcast. Join the OGB community. How about that? That's wonderful. Very nice. But here's the best one. I've been listening to the OGB podcast since the beginning, he says. My friend started listening after I mentioned the conversation about Scott and Justin Trudeau having a dual choice of weapon sledgehammer. <laughs> there you go. Sledgehammer, that's a personal. and the, <laughs> That's a personal duel. That's right. Is there any other kind? No, if you have like... An M1 Garand duel. Oh, right, right. But optics, a Leopold yeah. scope, right? Yeah, you start at one end of the, the national park, I start on the other. Right. Like a Fortnite game. <laughs> well, I appreciate those. That, that's a, a very, very humbling. I'm glad, I'm glad we're having an effect. That stuff makes Carl squirm so much, you guys. It's awesome. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it's, it's very gratifying. You know, I... I taught for 20 years in universities, and you always hoped somebody would at least react. Right. And not enough of them did. Some of them did. Some some very fine memories of some of the students. But uh, podcasts, a lot more people seem to get podcasts. Yeah. All right. Second half of the book is The Rise of the Empire of Texarkana. Yeah. Uh, this book is in three halves. The first half, this is my take. The first half is, uh, the preservation period. It's, it's mostly the brothers preserving what they found and categorizing and librarying and maintaining their culture, their monastic culture. Uh, the second half is the early, mm, 
rekindling of science and technology in the culture at large. And the first contacts with what is contemporary modernity for those people and the monastery that jive. Right. And then the third half is they've recovered all the technology and uh, second verse, same as the first. And uh, what, what happens? Right. The second half is there's this young man, Thon Thaddeo Farfentrot. It's a great name. Uh, who is the the new hotness? He's the new Isaac Newton, uh, and he wants to come and see the memorabilia. He's a a cousin of Hannigan, or an illegitimate nephew of Hannigan, who is the emperor of Texarkana. I just love the names; it's so funny. And the Texarkanans are at at war with the Laradians from Laredo, Texas. Mm-hmm. So good. <laughs> well, the problem with, with the Thon, I'm not sure what Thon comes from. I just assume that he's like, you know, you've got academic Dons. Yeah. I think he's just trifling on that, I think. But he's he's arrogant. He doesn't, he can't believe, and he's offended that these monks have these books. Yeah, he thinks it's a waste that they have them. And they own the books. If you've ever been in a library that has pre-Gutenberg texts, you'll see that they often are on the shelf, of course. And more often, they don't stand on their edges like we do do them in a library now. They're they're laying flat on the on the shelf. And they have a chain affixed to them. And there'll be a rod that's that runs horizontally along the entire length of the shelf, which might be very long. And that chain, uh, that, that rod goes through a link in the chain. So you can't, you can't leave with the book. You can roll a little trolley over to it and take it off the shelf, put it on the trolley, open up, read it, but you can't leave with it. That's the whole approach in a nut- nutshell. They are the archivists. They are responsible for these and they take it very, very seriously. Most of the originals have been packed up in kegs, in ca- the kegs have been encapsulated in lead, and then they've been put in a cellar for hundreds and hundreds of years. The chief librarian, brother librarian, I can't remember his name, doesn't want to open these kegs because he knows that every time they open one of those, those books will last a little less long. I love that. Yeah, you're not supposed to read them. The books are not for reading. <laughs> the books are be- for being preserved. Well, they have copies, though. But all of it's all chained up or locked away. And this guy thinks that's dumb. He thinks that's selfish or short-sighted, but he doesn't understand that the only reason they even exist for him to even come and look at and for, the commu- and for him to sneer at the community is because they've treated them that way and they've been so cautious and careful in their conservation of those things. Yeah. And the only reason that stuff exists is because they have been that way. Yeah, and the young scholar is is offended personally that this stuff is not his. He's offended. Like, one of the brothers has been poking around and has managed to figure out how to make a generator and an arc light. And so they set it up in the library for when this great scholar shows up, and they turn the lights on for him. And it doesn't go over well because he's upset that, that it wasn't him who figured out how to make the light. Miller writes at the end of chapter 18, but there was no balm to soothe an affront to professional pride then or in any other age. He can't believe that people that aren't him would do this stuff. He's very worried about religious people doing science. He thinks they won't do it very well. Like he says about Brother Kornhauer comes up with the light. What a shame that he's cooped up in a monastery. Mm Mm-hmm. For Thon Thaddeo, it's all about what can I do with the science? It's the dominion of man over nature. You can imagine he's going to go, he's going to do what Leonardo da Vinci did. He's going to make war machines for Hannigan. You know, that's why he gets paid. That's why the Hannigan Lord Mayor of Texarkana, that's why he pays his nephew to be a scholar because he wants to have guns and he wants to have, you know, ways to, to take over Laredo. Yeah, they're uh, just now in in gunpowder. 
I believe, as they have this second renaissance. Thaddeo, Taddeo comes and joins them, and he comes to a meal with the brothers. And if you've ever gone to one of these monasteries and had a meal with them, you'll know that there's a guy on a little raised platform in one of the corners or somewhere, and he's got a got a podium, and he's got a book on that podium. And you don't talk during the meals. Depends on what order you go visit with, but you don't speak. And he reads. He's the reader. And there's no telling what they're going to read that day. But they often will read about the lives of the saints and stuff like that. And uh, at the monastery that I go visit from time to time, he always reads that in some sort of a chanting kind of rhythm. Miller writes a a little section from a a Life of the Saints kind of book from, I don't know, 3400 AD. I thought this was just awesome, Carl. It's on 18, chapter 18. It's about the third page of that. And the prince smote the cities of his enemies with the new fire. And for three more days and nights did his great catapults and metal birds rain wrath upon them. Over each city a sun appeared and was brighter than the sun of heaven, and immediately that city withered and melted as wax under the torch. And the people thereof did stop in the streets, and their skin smoked, and they became as faggots thrown on the coals. And when the fury of the sun had faded, the city was in flames, and a great thunder came out of the sky, like a great battering ram, Picadon to crush it utterly. Poisonous fumes fell all over the land, and the land was aglow by night with the afterfire and the curse of the afterfire, which caused a scurf on the skin and made the hair to fall and the blood to die in the veins. I I think that's wonderful writing, to, to mimic that sort of, that style. And a great stink went up from earth unto heaven. It's awesome. But it's an account of the brief and destructive nuclear war. Yeah, you know, how would people remember it? With no writing. And the prince smote the cities of his enemies with the new fire, and for the three more days and nights did his great catapults and metal birds rain wrath upon them. That's the way you read to you. Yeah. Well, there's a reason they sing it. What is that reason? The reason is because it's an easy way to be loud. Ah. It's not very stressful to the voice, but it can be heard. Mm. When It's kind of like a... I feel like I'm an a monk at the abbey and trying to explain it. It's kind of like coherent light making a laser and the laser going farther. Mm. There's something about chanting that makes it able to be heard better. I also think it's easier for me to pay attention to. The dramatizations of the reader don't get in the way. Sure, for sure. But there was in that time a man whose name was Leibowitz who in his youth, like the Holy Augustine, had loved the wisdom of the world more than the wisdom of God. I love it. Yeah, the monastery that I go to, they uh, haven't gone in a while because of the Corona Deluge. So they do a lot of fasting because it's an Eastern it's an Eastern Catholic monastery and they do a lot more fasting. But they also, one of their monks, Father Moses, is, he was a five-star chef in his secular life. And so you're eating beans and rice, Lenten beans and rice, but it's the greatest food you ever had. Yep. Perfectly spiced. It would not be hard to go up there and be a a monk. At least you'd be well fed. I am taken by the the character of this, this scientist. He has no humility. He doesn't see humans as being worthwhile. There's a, a scene in the beginning where He's talking about some guy in the town. Look at him. He's got syphilis. He's got warts. You know, how could you how could you think that this is an heir to a great civilization? And the abbot's like, I see the image of Christ when I look at him. It's a diff- completely different way of thinking about the value of a human being. Okay, so the scholar sees a human being as, well, how does it help me? How does it help Hannigan? How does it help my earthly goals? And the abbot... So it's on page 129 of my book. Look at him, the scholar persisted. No, but it's too dark now. You can't see the syphilis outbreak on his neck, the way the bridge of his nose is being eaten away, paresis. But he was an un- undoubtedly a moron to begin with, illiterate, superstitious, murderous. He diseases his children. For a few coins, he would kill them. He'll sell them anyway when they're old enough to be useful. Look at him and tell me if you see the progeny of a once mighty civilization. What do you see? The image of Christ grated the Monsignor, surprised at his own sudden anger. What did you expect me to see? Two completely different ways of getting value out of the human being. 
he's useless because I can't get any use out of him. He's probably a moron anyway versus in this case, I'm sorry, it was the Monsignor, not the Abbot. The Monsignor, that's an unconditional valuing of the other. Because, you know, the scholar's going to do the same thing that the scholars did before the action in the book started. You know, have you ever been to Los Alamos? I have I have not. Super creepy. Yeah, I don't want to go. It's got to be haunted. And you drive up, and I remember I was driving up by myself on this road up in the mountains. One of the cool things was you look down and you see the tops of eagles, mm-hmm. which you don't see very much. The tops of eagles flying down in the valley. It's just so spooky. You're up there in this town where they invented the nuclear bomb. And uh, Percy writes about these these people. Uh, Walker Percy writes about these people. They were having a great time. Mm-hmm. It was thrilling. They're figuring out how to make the biggest weapon the world's ever known. Yeah, it's probably the most intellectually stimulating time that in those people's lives. And then what did, was it Oppenheimer? What did he say? I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Mm-hmm. We have what can you do versus what should you do? Yeah. Yeah, isn't there, isn't there some line from Jurassic Park about that? Right. Jeff Goldblum says, you never stop to think whether you should. Yeah. I'm trying to imitate Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> that was that was awful. <laughs> that was terrible. I can't do imitations. I'm sorry. I can't. Think a sped up Christopher Walken. <laughs> Maybe that'll get you there. The Monsignor and the Thawne have two incommensurable views of the purpose of man. And for the Thon, it is, you know, it's utility. You know, what can they do? What can they bring to the table? And those people at Los Alamos were on the edge of human achievement. Probably while they were in it, they were, they were being cared for. Plenty of money. Don't have to worry about tenure or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, you think you're safe in the world from um, the Japanese Empire or the the Axis or whatever. So you th- you know you like in your face it all looks good, and then you then they kick two bombs out the back door over Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and Oppenheimer says, "I am become death, destroy your worlds." Hmm. You wonder at the motives. Yeah. What the heck's going on? On page two hundred seven of my book which is in page tw- or chapter 20, it's about halfway through chapter 20, the Thon is looking at a chunk of a textbook that was in the archives. And part of the textbook is burned. And he sees all kinds of mathematics in here that he can't, he doesn't understand at first glance, but he thinks he can get to it. And he says, this is only one example of the many enigmas posed by these papers that you've kept so long. Reasoning which touches experimental reality nowhere is the business of angelologists and theologians, not of physical science. But yet such papers as these describe systems where, which touch our experience nowhere. That's quantum physics. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that if it's science that touches our experiential life nowhere, it probably is the realm of angelologists or (laughs) demonologists and ought to be left the hell alone. And, and I understand how um, quantum physics, well, I don't understand, but I have a notion of how quantum physics uh, predicts that, uh, helps us predict how superconductors will work and uh, certain electronics and so on. I, I understand that, but it still is uh, far divorced from uh, our physical reality. And I think that's a spooky place to be and screw in with that stuff. Let you do the whole E equals MC squared thing and create enormous amount of energy in uh, literally playing with fire. Yeah, I was thinking about this earlier. The technology is, I suppose it's wonderful. But then I think, you know, is it that here we are talking on a, a through technology? Yeah, but I'd rather just talk to you, though. Yeah, but podcasts are an artifact of technology. Yeah. And so we have all this stuff and everybody's very eager to get it. And you think it would not be a problem if we were all of good character. Like if you have firearms, if you have... Bombs don't kill people. Chemicals that could be poison. It's not a problem 
unless you're not of good character. So Aristotle says all the virtues you have to have one. You have to have all the virtues to have uh, one of them, mm-hmm. because if you have one vice, you're gonna you're gonna use all your wealth and all your power to support that vice. So if we were in an intact culture that valued things in an orderly way, technology would not be so destructive. If Texarkana wasn't trying to conquer everybody else, they heck, Texarkana sent a cattle plague out to the nomads. Mm-hmm. That's one of the details in the book. They sent diseased cattle so that the nomads would starve. You know, potato famine. People of bad character will use good things for bad ends. Like cell phones. Were there problems of bad character, significant problems of bad character at Los Alamos? Well, I don't, there's problems of bad character all through the 20th century because we weren't the only ones working on it. Right. So you end up having, you know, I'm, I don't want to second guess Truman. I, I'm, I'm happy. I don't have to make that decision. I got yeah. my own, my own Manhattan projects to deal with, but everyone else was going to do it. And so they were racing to be the first ones to do it, which is part of what Dom Paolo says in this argument in my book on page 234 with Tadio Tadio's speaking about the advancement of science. It's this long dialogue where they're they're talking over each other. You know, if you'd have us hampered by blind adherence, unreasoned dogma, then you'd prefer to leave the world in the same black ignorance and superstition that you say you're ordered to struggle against. And so he's giving this long spiel about how everything would be better. And the abbot closes it off and says about the human condition. It was never any better. It will never be any better. It will only be richer or poorer, sadder, but not wiser until the very last day. It's a different way of thinking of things. If you think you can make humans better, you're going to be tempted, really tempted by progress, and you won't be too concerned about the stuff that you break. If you have some perspective that humans are mostly the same things that they always were, then you can perhaps be the master of technology rather than it being the master of you. And for some reason, I'm thinking of Athy, what's his name from the Jaber Crow book? Athy Keith. Yeah. That what's most important is the human, not the technology. Mm-hmm. And just having the room for a question mark, you know, is it a good idea to give your 10-year-old a cell phone? Maybe not. Maybe not. You know? This whole Os Alamos problem made me think of the apology, you know, where uh, Socrates asks, you know, is it better to harm or to be harmed? Mm-hmm. Essentially. Yeah. And he says it's better to be harmed. He doesn't give us very many answers, Socrates. He pretty much lays that down, that it's better to, to be harmed than to harm. The worst thing that you can do is commit injustice. To have injustice done to you isn't really even harm. Yeah. So if you got other people working on the bomb, WWSD, what would Socrates do? <laughs> he would have gone home. Yeah, I think so. Thontadio. It's hard to say, isn't it? Thontadio. He has a will to power. <laughs> And, and I think that he sees that his power will manifest itself in an immortality that he would achieve through, you know, exposing these truths and creating this knowledge and moving this technology and this understanding forward that, that he would move the human race forward and that he would achieve greatness in doing that. Maybe I'm projecting what he went on. But, and that's just always a danger. Is that uh, you know people will, will seek that sort of greatness and uh, be motivated by that, by achieving the greatness, and not actually motivated by doing the good. It's Achilles. He, he could have stayed. He what he should have done was stay in the monastery, or at least lived in the town and hung out with them and studied, rather than going back to seek glory with with his uncle. Yeah, but he couldn't stand to do that. I mean, he says somewhere. What would you have me do? Work for the church? And while he's there, you know, his his escort, they're they're mapping out the fortifications of the monastery. You know, they're gonna take it over, they're gonna try to take it over and use it as a military outpost and it's it's just gross. Well, should we do section three? The third half. Ah, heartbreaking. Yeah, the third half, the first part of the third half. I wrote here in the margin, reads like Vonnegut. 
Was that an insult or a compliment? That's a good question. I have come to not like Vonnegut that much. Oh, he's really good. He's just, it's just so sad. I mean, we could read Slaughterhouse-Five at some point. Yeah. I think Vonnegut was very sad. The best thing he ever did was in that Rodney Dangerfield movie. I don't know about that. Oh, no, it's yeah. called Back to School. And so Rodney Dangerfield goes back to school. I, I forget his name of his character, but he never got his college degree. And so he goes back to finish it. He hires Kurt Vonnegut to write him a paper on Kurt Vonnegut. And of course, the professor gives him a C and says, whoever wrote this obviously knew nothing about Kurt Vonnegut. I like it. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's just too experimental. It's like, write your damn story. But this part, did you like it? So this is chapter 24. I found it eerie because it's kind of a, gosh, I don't know how much to read of it. We are the sentries, we are the chin choppers and the golly whoppers, and soon you shall discuss the amputation of your head. We are your singing garbage men, sir and madam, and we march in cadence behind you, chanting rhymes that some think odd. Hut, two, three, four, left, left. He had a good wife, but he left, 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 right, left. Wir, as they say in the old country, marschieren weiter, wenn alles in Scherben fällt. We are of your earless and your mesoless. It's just kind of kaleidoscopic. But then it ends with this, uh, gosh, here then the last canticle of the brethren of the order of libo it says sung by the century that swallowed its name lucifer is fallen kyrie eleison lucifer is fallen christe eleison lucifer is fallen kyrie eleison eleison imas kyrie eleison means lord have mercy in greek lucifer is fallen the se the code words flashed electrically across the continent were whispered in conference rooms were circulated in the form of crisp memoranda stamped supreme secretissimo uh it's this um They've detected radiation, and they call it Lucifer. Yeah. Lucifer means the light bearer, and it's also a word for the devil. And so you have that image. If you know what one of these things looks like, it's like the light of the sun over a city. They're doing it again. Same old stuff. Uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable because China... <laughs> And uh, whatever the heck country this is at this point. Texarkana. It's still Texarkana, yeah. This is several hundred years after Brother Francis. This is several hundred years after uh, Von Taddeo comes back, comes to the monastery. Texarkana and, well, it's China. And I think they actually say it's China. Are saber rattling. There's a, a nuclear explosion in China the people of Laredo, or I'm sorry, Texarkana, don't know what the heck is going on. The Chinese are saying, you you bombed us. And the Americans are saying it was an industrial accident over there that you're blaming on us. Awfully boring and uh, familiar. Yeah. So we have not yet had, we have only had two of these bombs detonated in anger. So what Miller was worried about has not happened yet. God willing, it will never happen. However... I don't know. The, the book's entirely believable. You know, he was writing in 1959, and we read Junger's book about World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars, and you would think nobody could be moronic enough to do that again. Well, what was it, 1939, whenever Hitler invaded Poland? We did it again, and worse. And then they invented the bomb, and we haven't done it since because everyone's afraid about that. They're definitely going to do it again. You know, if they exist over the fullness of time, I mean, you have to be perfect and not detonate one of those bombs every moment. Like, if they exist, to get one to not go off, you have to not do it every single moment. Seems right. Mm -hmm. Well, over the fullness of time, there's no way for it to be perfect forever. You have a malfunction, a madman, a weird misunderstanding, something. Like, if they exist, it will ultimately be used. It's like the, what the IRA said to Margaret Thatcher. You have to be lucky every day. We only have to be lucky once. Right. It, so that what I'm saying is the novel's entirely believable, that we could do some damn fool thing like that and then do it again a thousand years later. Yeah. And so I'm going back to that. For me, it's 234 when the abbot in the middle section says it was never any better. It will never be any better. 
will only be rich or poor or sadder, but not wiser till the very last day. It's a different view of human nature that if you think that we're the bright ones, we're the wise ones, you know, that we're going to um, do everything well, I think you're making, probably making a mistake about human nature. I think the trads are too. I'm looking at you, Carl. How so? Modernity is not the problem. The flawed nature of man is the problem. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. Even if you're some sort of weird materialist, you can say until man evolves, it gets a bigger prefrontal cortex and smaller adrenals and all that, you know, whatever. It's always going to be this way. Yeah. And the temptation is to say, no, we're the ones that are going to fix it. Seven billion people to convince. Well, and every generation ends up being the same sort of thing that the previous generation was. As, as the great philosopher Pete Townsend said, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, won't get fooled again. I walked into a room the other day and my kids were in there. I said, why don't you turn the lights on so you can see? Just like my parents. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> Same old, same old, man. Yeah, it's it's very tempting. I when I say tempting, so for me as um a Catholic of some sort, a temptation means an opportunity for a sin. It's a bad thing. Okay? Uh it's a bad thing to let yourself be tempted. So like when Brother Francis goes to confession in the beginning and and well, did you want to eat it? Well, no, but I entertained thoughts about it. You know, so putting yourself in the way of temptation is itself a temptation and a sin. Okay, so I'm speaking a little bit theologically. If you're not on board with that, that's fine. Just get the core point that I'm trying to make is that I say it is a temptation of progress to think that you're going to be the ones to make everything better. Because it will lead you to do all sorts of probably bad things. You'll probably squash a whole lot of people trying to make them better. Yeah, you said that that's like a, some sort of a theological argument. Like, why does it have to be a theological argument? Well, because sin is a theological concept. That's all. Well, well, in, in, but you framed it in terms of temptation. You just think about somebody that has a drinking problem. They don't need to go to the bar. Right. Don't put yourself in a situation to be temptated. In, temptated. <laughs> <laughs> to be tempted. That's what they say in Katusa. Temptated. I was tempted last week. You know, I was I was thinking about a guy I know, and I thought I've got to tell Carl this. I didn't. I wasn't going to tell him on the podcast, but I'm going to anyway. I know a guy that they call mayonnaise. <laughs> He's a giant person. He's like six four, and when he was twenty one, he probably weighed three oh five. He's just a farm kid, and they called him that because mayonnaise a lot of boy over there. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, mayonnaise. Yeah, the temptation to make everything better is, it's the temptation to plow it under. Yeah, you know, where's Socrates, you know? What is better? Right. Nobody ever asked that. Right, what are you progressing toward? What is better? What does better mean? If it was better, how would you know? Like, where's your better meter that you can look at? We don't even talk about it. Yeah, what is the good life? If you ask that in a in a classroom or in a seminar, our folks at OGB, they'll give us some wonderful answers on that. But a typical group of people that you ask, oh, what is happiness? Just try this. What is happiness? People will say, well, it's whatever you want it to be. I don't think so. Mm -mm. I don't think so. And if that's the answer... Well, that's not going to mean a whole bunch of free individuals le leading their own lives unmolested by other people. It's going to mean whoever's the strongest among you, it's going to be what he thinks the good life is. It's the will to power all the way down. Hmm. We've we got to read some more Friedrich. Yeah. We can do that. I'm, I'm up for that. I love Friedrich Nietzsche. He's my frenemy. We need to bring JP in on this too, Pascarella. Yeah. So they're going to do it again in, in book three, uh, third section. They're going to do it again. And there's some, I don't know if I really want to tell the ending because it's, it's one of those moments of, there's some moments of fairy tale grace in this story. But one of the really stunning things to me, especially knowing, well, they set up euthanasia centers. 
mercy camps. Mercy camps for all of the people who are suffering the uh, the effects of the fallout. And the abbot is just really upset with this. He actually punches the doctor. I love that. In the nose. Kind of like St. Nicholas did. You know St. Nicholas did that? Mm, yeah. According to legend, punched Arius in the nose. Because he doesn't want them to recommend euthanasia. You know, what this does is it makes the evil deeds easier. And that's his objection. If if you, you know, let all the people that you killed, delayed killed, if you let them go into the magic box and be vaporized so they don't suffer, you know, it sounds like mercy, but it's, and maybe it is. I mean, there's a big quote that Walker Percy, I think she, I think he borrowed it from Flannery O'Connor, tenderness leads to the gas chamber. Hmm. You know, I, I want to eliminate suffering. You end up eliminating people. And the abbot is just really upset by that. He has a bunch of monks walk up and down outside the, the euthanasium with signs that say, abandon every hope ye who enter here. That's awesome. And I think that's an interesting point, you know? Yeah, to eliminate, I, I got to go back to what you said there, to eliminate suffering. I mean, people suffer. Yeah. Well, it's a good question. What is suffering? Yeah. Is it just pain? If yeah. the only evil you know is pain, which is all the doctor knows, then all the, the only good that he can do is the elimination of pain. Of pain. Yeah. Yeah. H- humans suffer, and I think that's part of our nature. If you really want to eliminate suffering, you'd have to get rid of all of them. All of them. Yep. Well, should we tell them the ending? Should we make them read it? Yes. We're getting ready to tell you the ending. If you do not want to hear about the ending, then <laughs> move along. They have this plan. I forget the Latin name for it. They have this plan that the Vatican has worked out that they're going to invoke it's something like the Latin means where the flock goes, the pastor goes always also like Grex Peregrinata or something. Cause you know, all church documents have Latin names. So that's where you get that antiquity into this novel. Yeah, it's the big mosey. They're going to mosey on. Yeah. They're going to mosey on. So what they're doing is brother Joshua is the order has been recruiting from the spacing guilds. <laughs> spacing guilds. That we're yeah. mixing our books. I'm mixing our books. I'm sorry. I like it. So they're setting up because if the earth is destroyed, well, the thought is that they still need the church. And so they're sending the monastery off into space and they get out just by the skin of their teeth. And for me, that uh, this haunting thing is on 337... They sang as they lifted the children into the ship. They sang old space chanties and helped the children up the ladder one at a time and into the hands of the sisters. They sang heartily to dispel the fright of the little ones. When the horizon erupted, the singing stopped. They passed the last child into the ship. The horizon came alive with flashes as the monks mounted the ladder. The horizons became a red glow. A distant cloud bank was born where no cloud had been. The monks on the ladder looked away from the flashes. When the flashes were gone, they looked back. The visage of Lucifer mushroomed into hideousness above the cloud bank, rising slowly like some titan climbing to its feet after ages of imprisonment in the earth. Someone barked an order. The monks began climbing again. Soon they were all inside the ship. The last monk, upon entering, paused in the lock. He stood in the open hatchway and took off his sandals. Sic transit mundus, he murmured, looking back at the glow. He slapped the soles of his sandals together beating the dirt out of them. The glow was engulfing a third of the heavens. He scratched his beard, took one last look at the ocean, then stepped back and closed the hatch. And, you know, then they're gone. There's some some stuff there. Oh, boy, he dusted the... Here he shook the dust from off of his feet. Yeah, which was... Uh, this is some biblical stuff. That you, there's some echoes there. I know my buddy Jacob, who listens to this, will probably know all of those. So when Jesus commanded the disciples to go out and preach, and he said, if you say to these people, peace be with you, and you stay with them, but if they they don't accept you, you shake the dust off your sandals when you leave. Then we have like the third of the heavens, 
That's from Revelation. When the dragon sweeps down a third of the stars from the sky. Mm. It's eerie stuff. The mushroom cloud as the visage of Lucifer. Yeah. That's some good writing. <sighs> well, he never wrote another novel. He wrote one, but it didn't. he didn't survive to finish it. It's a fantastic book. That third half is where it gets science fiction-y again. Mm-hmm. Which is fun. I mean, it's sad as hell. And it's not, there. Uh, there's there's maybe a happy ending if you hold your mouth just right and squint. <laughs> but the thing it made me think about was, you know, wh- what are we doing to make sure that we keep the lights on? And this whole, this whole project, civilization, is is fragile, you know? How many people know how to graft uh, grapevines onto good rootstock? How many people know how to draw a wire? Who knows how to make cheese? You know, I mean, it's all these things that we just take for granted. It's it's tenuous, and, you know, what, what are we doing? So I was thinking about, what am I aware of that humans are doing to help with this situation? And I, I thought of a few things. There's this thing they call the Svalbard... Uh, global seed vault. Have you heard of this thing? Yeah, I think so. It's up near the Arctic Circle in Sweden. I think it's in Sweden. Let me look. No, it's in Norway. And they've got like seed samples from like 10,000 different plants. It's up there where it never gets over like 18 below Celsius, buried deep, deep in the ground. Um, There are some projects... I think that the founders of archive.org, I didn't look this up to verify it, but some some group, and I think it's the archive.org people, have been digitizing books and then putting them in shipping containers, Hmm. filling them with nitrogen and welding them shut and burying them. We need more of that. We need people to take old Bridgeport mills and lathes and things that are not numerically controlled and old analog instruments and archiving those, packing them in cosmoline, putting manuals with them. Just in case. Putting them in argon field chambers. Yes. Just in case. Yes. Let me tell you about fragility that I've experienced just in this 2020 civilization situation. So future listener, we have a garage freezer and it shows the middle of summer to quit. We lost a whole bunch of food. And I have a big family. We like to have a lot of food. We buy in bulk and we store it and then we eat it. Well, you can't buy a freezer. It is impossible right now to buy a freezer. Supply lines are broken. Factories aren't building them. What happened was people freaked out because of the quarantines and lockdowns and they bought all the freezers. And so the supply ticked up maybe 3% and went way beyond what the manufacturers were able to supply. And so, which means concretely, you can't get one. There's no place to get one. It didn't take much to expose the fragility in that. I don't know where the freezers are made. They're probably made, I mean, they're not made here. And so it doesn't take much. Think through, just think through supply lines for everything. If you want to stay up at night and you live in New York City, think about where your water comes from. Oop. It comes down these clay pipes down the Hudson Valley. You know, it wouldn't take much to shut off your water, which is it's not fear-mongering or anything, but, you know, if you don't know how to do anything, then you're dependent. It would be good to know how to do some stuff, and it'd be good to preserve some stuff for the ages. Uh, Gutenberg, for example, all of those books are stored in plain text. I got files from stuff I wrote back in grad school, on floppy disks that I don't have a computer that can read them anymore. I do. Send those to me. We'll put them on the blog. Oh, they're not that important. I think I have extracted them, but thinking that things will always endure the way they are now, I, I think is probably hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Do, do we have an obligation to do anything about it, Carl? <sighs> well, if there's stuff that's good and true and beautiful... Well, it it only exists, it exists in its representation. Are Bridgeport Mills good and beautiful? 
I'm not exactly sure what a Bridgeport mill is. You'd have to explain it. See, I don't know. Yeah. So you got your lathe. You know what a lathe is. Mm-hmm. Well, if you want to make things flat and do things uh, not about an axis, but, you know, mm. in an X and a Y or a Z uh, plane, you'd use a mill. Right. So if you wanted a part made that didn't exist, you have to have these sorts of things in order to make the part. Yeah. And if you don't have them, you'll never get the part. Yeah. Or you have to do it with a f file. and uh... Which will take you longer than the lifetime of the truck you're trying to fix. Yeah. 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 So uh, it's an eerie book. It's a good book. Um, it's a sad book. Uh, Miller himself, he flew 55 bombing missions in World War II uh, as a tail gunner in a bomber if you can imagine. So um, it's a book born out of that experience. Sad guy. Yep. There's another Vonnegut, you know, parallel. Yeah. That war broke a lot of fine people. What are we going to read next? <sighs> is it going to be more fun? <laughs> this is a fun book. It's funny it at fun. spots. It's very funny in spots. Yeah. But it, it, it's a, a deep book about deep things. I hope you guys read it. And, and I hope that you find things that you think are important and good and beautiful and true and take some step to preserve those things. We try to do that. Like one of the things that Carl said when we first started working on uh, getting the online great books thing off the ground was everybody needs a complete Play-Doh hardback, a good <laughs> edition of well, that's part of it, right? You know, acid-free paper, hardback, sewn-in signatures. You know, the the edition we send out is a pretty darn good one. It's not a, a thousand-year edition. I want to do that at some point. But we try to send them a good one, and they get a good, durable, uh, complete Aristotle in two volumes. Uh, you know, so we. But there's probably something in your life that you ought to put in a life raft in a time capsule and. That can look like uh, building a spaceship, or it might just mean you teach some younger person that thing. Mm hmm Yeah, I, I'll give you an example. Um, in the state of Illinois, there is a problem in the management of waterfowl. Hmm. There's too many. There's not enough hunters. At least this was the case last year, I think. And the reason why is because where do people learn how to hunt? Their grandfather takes them out. Yeah. Well, we stopped that. Nobody does that anymore. So nobody knows how to do it. It's inconceivable to them. And so now you have, you know, too many ducks. It's inconceivable. Yeah. So preserve something. Uh, meanwhile, uh, next week we'll be reading Bellock's An Essay on the Restoration of Property. The edition I'm reading is the IHS Press edition. I'm excited about it. It's been on my infinity, infinity stack for uh, way, way, way too long. So uh, we'll get that done. Yeah, it's not capitalism. It's not communism. It's distributivism. Yes. An alternative might be uh, thought-provoking for you. Yeah, I like that. I, th I think that's what I am. I think that's what I've always been. I just didn't know the word. <laughs> so I'm excited to, uh, to see what Mr. Belloc says about it. And then the week after that, Bar the door. It's going to be Repressive Tolerance by Herbert Marcusa. Continental. <laughs> that sigh, dear listeners, uh, just so you know what, what we're doing for you, that, that sigh means oh, I got so much to read. It, but, and it also means I'm not really excited about Marcusa. Come oh, on. it'll be fun. It'll be good. Ugh. I am... More intellectually engaged right now from having to do this podcast, not having to do, from getting to do this podcast than I ever was in my academic career. I'll say you that. You know, we had a, I had a guy quit online great books the other day. Oh, no. Hey, good riddance, dude. <laughs> and he says that the decorum, he said that the decorum of our um, seminar host was inappropriate for an academic setting. And I emailed him back and I said, you're absolutely right. This is not an academic setting. 
<laughs> there are lots of them out there. Best of luck to you and all your your searches. I wonder what I did. Did I burp? Yeah. Who knows? It might have been funny. You might have been interesting. You might not have given him the answers. You know, all of those things, you know, to be boring, humorless, and uh, pedantic and just spew answers at people and want them to spew them back. I'm going to blame Emmett. Yeah, right. All of those things would be appropriate for an academic setting, right? So we try to have fun. We try not to give answers. It's the university, like Brett Vinat says. That's right. All right. I really like the book. I'm glad I read it. I will definitely read this one again. I just don't know when. <laughs> Uh, but I will definitely read that one again. Again, uh, go leave your review for us. Wherever the heck it is you listen to this kind of thing, uh, send a copy of it or forward it over to one of your buddies. Um, if there's one of these books that we have done that has been interesting to you, why don't you uh, email a bunch of your friends and say, let's read this book. And then we'll all meet over at my house on a Thursday and I'll have cheese and uh, light beer or whatever it is you drink, sweet tea and cornbread or whatever it is you all do. And you're going to talk about this book. And then when it's all over, you'll be glad you did that for that evening. Yep. It will be so much better than Tiger King on Netflix. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah, go do that. You won't regret it. Yeah, we never regret doing excellent things. Right. All right. There's another show. Thank you so much for listening. And we will talk to you next week about block, bollocks, <laughs> an essay on the restoration of property. We'll talk to you then. Bye.